What better title to have than that of the father of judo? Well, that is how Jigoro Keino, born in the seaside town of Kigage near Kobe in 1860, is today affectionately known. Keino's father was both a Shinto priest as well as a government shipping official. His mother died when Keino was nine and he was sent to a series of exclusive private schools in Tokyo. During his time in education, Keino was repeatedly picked upon by the boys until in desperation he asked a man called Ryuji Katagiri, whom he knew familiar was whom he, whom he knew was familiar with the bandit art of jiu-jitsu to show him some of what he knew. Katagiri did so, only to then inform Kano that jiu-jitsu was not really suitable for someone as puny as himself. Kano, however, was smitten. He went on to the renowned Tokyo Imperial University, where he quickly found a number of different jiu-jitsu instructors, commonly osteopaths, who traditionally practiced jiu-jitsu. Kano's desire for martial arts knowledge was something his father had strictly forbidden, believing it would disturb his studies. Kano's father also believed, like many Japanese, that jiu-jitsu was for yobs. But the fact that Kano was prepared to go against his father's wishes, something virtually unheard of at that time, suggests both an uncommon strength of mind and, something almost concealed by his diligent studying, a slightly rebellious character. Jiu-jitsu training was hard and frequent. Sometimes there was not even the luxury of tatami mats to land upon, just hard wooden floors. Techniques were shown by the teacher just once. The student had to be sure that he was paying close attention, as he would then have to use the same technique in the ensuing randori, or free practice sessions. So determined was Kano to learn, and so hard did he train, that he seems almost to have overdosed on jiu-jitsu over the following two years. He would frequently awake, screaming the names of various techniques, his quilt soaked in sweat as he kicked it away from his futon. At the age of 21, Kano was highly skilled in a style of jiu-jitsu known as Tenjin Shinyoryu, Divine True Willow School. He resisted, however, the invitation to graduate from student to teacher, as he considered that he still had a great deal left to learn. There then came the fateful day when a 200-pound, virtually twice Kano's own weight, student named Kinchiki Fukushima challenged him to a fight. Somewhat inevitably, Kano lost, and furious, he went away to reflect upon how a small man could actually beat a much larger opponent. Kano was already obsessed with the idea of making the most efficient use of mental and physical energy. He considered that there was altogether too much wasted effort in the numerous different styles of jiu-jitsu, and, besides, which style could be considered correct? Kano had studied jiu-jitsu intensively, but he was still often confused about what was and what was not the correct in, in the terms of technique and too many teachers were fond of saying that theirs was the only true form. Also, due to Kano's love affair of the West, he had, through his own endeavour, learned to speak English fluently by the age of 22. He thought that the martial arts could, like baseball, be a way of uniting people from all backgrounds and classes. So Kano began adopting and adapting techniques that only accorded with his basic philosophy, which he summarised thus. To understand what is meant by gentleness or giving way, let us say a man is standing before me whose strength is ten, and that my own strength is but seven. If he pushes me as hard as he can, I am sure to be pushed back or knocked down, even if I resist with all my might. This is opposing strength with strength. But if, instead of pushing him, I give way to the extent he is pushed, withdrawing my body and maintaining my balance, my opponent will lose his balance. Weakened by his awkward position, he will be unable to use all his strength. It will have fallen to three. Because I retain my balance, my strength remains at seven. Now I am stronger than my opponent and can defeat him by using only half my strength, keeping the other half available for some other purpose. Even if you are stronger than your opponent, it's better first to give way. By doing so, you conserve energy while exhausting your opponent. Kano went back to grapple with Fukushima, who, as before, confidently charged towards him. This time, however, Kano easily beat the much larger man with his devastating katagaruma, or shoulder-wheel throw. Kano consequently took nine students and established his own dojo or training hall in the Eishoji Buddhist temple. The impact of the students' training, however, quickly caused parts of the temple floor to collapse. Although Kano could frequently be, be found underneath these sections, armed with a torch and some tools as he sought to repair the damage. He may be young, but Mr. Kano really is an outstanding man. What a fine person he would be if he would only leave this judo alone, lamented Choshinpo, the head priest who then insisted that Kano move the dojo to his own room, own home. So the dojo had to be relocated, and this new dojo was in fact the first incarnation of the world-famous Korokan, which remains the headquarters of the judo world to this day.
Its fundamental philosophy was that a martial artist had to be able to make mistakes and yet survive in order to learn. What was used if a mistake resulted only in crippling injury or even fatality? Sweat, training, conditioning and, above all else, timing was so much more important than a perfect form in a false environment. Ultimately, Kano took everything that was deemed bad about jiu-jitsu, the macho brutality, the excessive risk of serious injury, the unruly, bullying students, out of judo, creating a more sports-like martial art that would develop and nurture a young person's mental and physical sides, not just their fighting prowess. To put it succinctly, judo was deemed to be the physical expression of an ideal society. Strictly translated, judo is the gentle way. And yet, Kano stressed, the use of the word gentleness here was technically incorrect. Better to instead think of the ability to temporarily yield and thus feign defeat in order that you might win. Ultimately, it was best to develop mushin, or no mind. To not expend conscious thought on what you are doing. To not trouble yourself with pointless ruminations on victory or defeat. The Zen-like frame of mind was ideal. Kokotan bylaws were drawn up in 1884 when it was stated that judo was intended to promote physical culture, mental training and winning contests. A tradition was begun with Kagami Baraki, or rice cutting ceremony, when on the second Sunday of every January, students ran for miles in freezing conditions, before returning to an equally frigid dojo for a good few hours worth of training. In 1886, Kodogan students went up against a powerful jiu-jitsu school called Totsuka Ha Ryoshin Ryu, Few considered that Kano's lots to the snowball's chance in hell, and yet they emerged the victors. This firmly put judo on the martial arts map, and started to attract serious and widespread interest in the Kodokan and judo in general. Kano himself was now fast becoming something of a legend. Over 160 pounds of well-defined muscle, the strength in his legs in particular widely marvelled over. In fact, Kano was uncharacteristically vain about his legs, on occasion pulling up his students to show an un- unsuspecting visitor his calf muscles. He was also a workaholic, teaching at a, a, teaching at a school for the children of Japan's elite, called Gakushin, when not at his beloved Kodokan. He would often work late into the night preparing lectures for the following day. When he did relax, it was usually in the ritual that took him from one working environment to the other. He was fond of a little sake, although he refrained from tobacco his whole life. Kano was married in 1891 to the daughter of the former ambassador to Korea and four years later was made headmaster of the Gakushin. This was in spite of his relative youth, he was still only 35. Kano instituted various changes to the school, including making students perform menial tasks such as cleaning so that they might learn humility. As the 19th century dawned, the decline in popularity of jiu-jitsu was undoubtedly because of Japan's ever-increasing enthusiasm for judo. This was a source of some upset to Kano, given that he had started his martial arts career with jiu-jitsu and was an expert in several different styles before judo. It was jiu-jitsu, after all, that had allowed Kano to find the way to judo. So setting aside his basic distrust of kata, a series of pre-learned movements, Kano set about doing something that would categorise and preserve at least some of Japan's finest moves and techniques in buddhi, fighting arts, which in samurai times would have consisted of jiu-jitsu, had weapons not been involved. To this day, a student hoping to become a first-hand black belt will need to show the nage no kata and many other kata as they progress through further down rankings. Kano also asked leading jiu-jitsu masters to assist him as he established the training syllabus at the Kodokan. Everyone knew, however, that judo was fast replacing jiu-jitsu in Japan. The 1930s saw Japan move ever closer towards war, something that dismayed Kano. He was a pacifist and thus repelled by the hardline stance being taken by the Japanese government, who wished to turn his beloved Kodokan into a military academy. Kano strongly objected to this and wasn't shy in making his anti-war sentiments known. So much so that, when he apparently died of pneumonia on board a Japanese steamer making its way home from Egypt in May 1938, there was a whisper that he had in fact been murdered by government agents, tired of his vocal opposition.